Good morning, everyone. My name is Christy McKenzie. I'm the Assistant Coordinator of Neighborhood Services for the Erie County Department of Senior Services. I would like to take a moment to thank you all for joining our 2021 Elder Law Day Summer Series. This series will be virtual this year as well as last year. This series will also take place every Tuesday and Wednesday throughout the summer, starting at 10 a.m., including a variety of topics. I'd also like to take a moment to thank those who have made this summer series possible again this year, including our county executive, Mark Colencars, our senior services commissioner, David Shank, and Karen Nicholson, the CEO for the Center for Elder Law and Justice. This program will also be recorded and available on both our website and YouTube at a later date. If you need to ask any questions, we ask that you use the question and answer panel in the bottom right. Please refrain from including any personal information in those questions, and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. Please allow me to introduce our guest speakers. Alex Berman is a staff attorney for the Center for Elder Law and Justice. His work in the foreclosure field includes representing clients at settlement conferences, litigating defenses to the foreclosure action, and assisting clients in working out loss mitigation options with their lenders so they can keep their home ownership. Alex also represents tenants in housing matters. We also hope to have Tatiana Robinson who is the Assistant Legal Counsel at the Buffalo Municipal Housing Authority, representing the BMHA in civil litigation matters and regulatory compliance, joining us a little bit later. For now, I'll turn it over to you, Alex. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. McKenzie. Um, my name is Alex, like she said, I am a staff attorney here at Center for Elder Law and Justice. And so what I'm going to be presenting on today is really the foreclosure process as it exists currently in New York State, as well as the changes that COVID has necessitated to that system. So as we'll go through, we'll see that there have been quite a few COVID-19 related changes to the foreclosure process. And even though the general process might be familiar to some of the people uh, attending today's presentation, some of the changes uh, have been quite recent. So I think it's it's a good idea to go over those. So let's dive into that. For, let's see. Okay, good. The PowerPoint is working, which is always a good thing. Uh, just a quick disclaimer for anyone who's not an attorney that is watching. This is just for informational purposes only. It is not legal advice, nor is it to be interpreted as legal advice. And the information that I go over today may or may not be uh, specific or applicable to an individual case. So I recommend that if you have any foreclosure related questions, you contact an attorney for advice about your specific situation. And there will be some resources that you can contact later on. So oh, generally, um, the mortgage foreclosure process in New York State, which is where we're going to be spending the bulk of this present half of the presentation, is not quick by any stretch of the imagination, um, can take anywhere from six months on up. And that was before COVID-19. Um, since COVID, that timeline has really expanded. And so right now it can take even longer. And as these things change and evolve, I'm sure that that timeline will also change. But right now you're looking at uh, potentially nine months on up at the uh, very minimum amount of time for a foreclosure in New York State to go through as a general ma matter. Um, and then just as a bit of a housekeeping matter on language that I use, I use bank, lender, and mortgage company interchangeably. Um, they are different entities, but for the sake of just brevity, I'll probably just be referring it to your lender or mortgage company as a bank. I know sometimes it's credit union, sometimes it is an individual, but by and large, they are banks, and that tends to be how I refer to them. So there are a specific series of steps that they need to take in order to foreclose on a mortgage in New York State. We'll go over some of those today. And the good thing is that there are plenty of procedures and safeguards in place to help borrowers work with the bank to keep their homes. We'll also go over those today. For borrowers, the biggest thing uh, to keep in mind is that you should pay attention to the process and be involved in the process. If you're involved, it is likely that you'll have a positive outcome. Uh, ideally, that is keeping your home, but sometimes that may involve a sale or other liquidation options, which we'll touch on. 
But if you bury your head in the sand and let this process go by, even though it's very stressful, and I understand that being involved in the process and sort of pulling back that curtain of what's going on tends to not only get a better outcome, but make things much less stressful and easier to understand. Um, currently, as I said before, in New York and the United States federal government have implemented some additional protections for borrowers due to COVID-19. However, uh, it is worth noting that these protections generally do not apply to vacant properties or properties that you're no longer living in. They may also require that you prove that you are the owner occupant of the property to uh, take advantage of some of these additional resources and protections. Come on, if this will work. So let's go through the general process. The first thing that happens is what we call a hardship, and that is the reason that a borrower fell behind on their payments. It could be unemployment, loss of rental income, increased medical expenses, all things that we're seeing now as a result of COVID-19, even with the high vaccination rate in New York State, we're still seeing some loss of rental income, some unemployment and medical expenses as big contributing factors to people having mortgage difficulty. Um, as much as we might want to not pay our mortgage, just deciding not to pay is not a valid hardship and you won't be able to take advantage of some of the resources available to you. Uh, once you after the hardship, the hardship leads directly into the default. And this is where you've missed not just one or two payments generally, but it's usually about three that it's enough that the bank has said, okay, you've broken your obligation to pay. We are not going to be collecting um, payments anymore. And we're going to require the entire back owed amount, which most people can't pay right off the bat. Um, however, late fees and interest will continue to accrue during this time. So if you miss one payment, you might be hit with a late fee. You miss about say three or four. Not only are they gonna hit you with that late fee, they'll want that entire three to four payments all in one lump sum. Um, this is where people tend to run into some issues because that is just high enough in most circumstances that people cannot pay. Um, the nice thing though is currently there are some COVID protections that you can sneak in after the hardship, but before the default. So if there's a COVID-19 related hardship, you may be able to get a loan forbearance where the bank will not collect monthly payments for a specific amount of time. Usually that's three months while you take care of the COVID hardship and hopefully get yourself back on track. And then you start making payments again. Um, this is different based off of your individual bank. So it's important that you contact them to see what options you might be um, eligible for. However, you should know that for those missed payments, some banks will put that as a lump sum at the end of the loan. Some banks will extend the loan term by however many months you were in forbearance. So if you had a three months where you weren't making normal payments, your overall loan term is extended by three months, for example, but that's gonna be based individually off of your bank. So contact them for some more information on that. Additionally, if you are experiencing a COVID-19 related hardship, you can submit, if you're in foreclosure already to the courts and the bank, a hardship declaration form, which can be found at newyorkcourts.gov, um, or you can Google uh, New York COVID hardship form for mortgage, and it will be like the first link that pops up. You do want to submit that to both the court and the bank. If you are behind, but they're not in foreclosure, submit that to the bank, and that will uh, hold off on a foreclosure action for a while, uh, usually while you work with them to see if you can get a forbearance or some other relief option. Um, so after the default, the bank will send out a 90 day notice. This is New York state requirement, informing that if you do not make up the missed payments with the fees that have accrued within 90 days, the lender will start foreclosure proceedings. This is not a foreclosure action, nor is it a notice of sale. This is just letting you know that you have this opportunity to pay what you owe back, or, and if you don't proceed to a foreclosure action. It's just to give you and notice that this is happening as the borrower. Most people at this time, um, if they're in a hardship that has led to a default, 
can't pay that back, if you can and you want to, great. But if you can't, then it will continue to a foreclosure action. One important thing to note is if there are multiple borrowers on the loan, this notice will be sent to all of the borrowers. That's a New York State requirement. Even if only one has been making the payments and has been working with the bank. Where we see this is in divorce actions where a couple has been divorced. One has gotten the property and they're in charge of the mortgage, but the other spouse has not been removed from the mortgage itself. They will also get notice. So something to keep in mind there. Um, if you're wondering why you know, your ex-husband, ex-wife is getting this notice, it's because the bank's required to send that to them if they're on the mortgage, regardless of what could happen in the divorce action. Next will come a foreclosure complaint. And this is what starts off the foreclosure action. This is going to be filed with the county or New York State Supreme or the lowest level court in New York State saying, we have this debt that's secured by this house. We want to be able to go forward and sell this house so we can get our money back. Um, the location where that happens is the property, not where the borrowers live. So if you have um, a property that's going into foreclosure in Erie County, but you live in Wyoming County, they're going to file it in Erie County because that's where the property at issue is. Um, then you will be served. You'll get the legal papers, usually in the mail. Sometimes they will come out and hand them to you. Um, you can then answer or file with the court a response to that complaint. And we'll go over that a little bit more in just a few moments. And in almost every mortgage contract you sign, I have seen one where they did not have this. But in 99.9% .9 of the time, as part of your mortgage contract, you agree that in the event of a default and foreclosure, the lender can add their attorney's fees onto what you owe on the loan. So just be aware of that at that time. If you're wondering why your payment has, or your total amount owed has shot up by a few thousand dollars, that's probably why. Another thing to keep in mind once this complaint's filed, the foreclosure is public information. So people can find that if they know where to look. Um, housing sites like Zillow sometimes will do a quick search and will update their sites on that. So that's really not something that can be gotten around because the foreclosure is public info. You can call up like the county clerk's office and look at some of these, uh, the status of some of these properties. Um, same thing, and with the notice, all borrowers named as defendants can be liable for that amount owed, even if there was a divorce action. If it doesn't really, um, even if you agree between the two of you, one's going to pay, the mortgage would be liable for that, that the bank will make both of you liable because that's what's on the mortgage contract, and that's what really controls that situation. Um, just because you have this private agreement between the two of you as a divorce, doesn't relieve your obligation to pay on the loan with what you sign with the bank. Uh, an answer is really quickly and simply just a document you file with the court disputing claims the lender has made, um, raises issues on the lender's legal right to foreclose. There are some standard defenses. I would always consult with an attorney relative to your specific situation before you file an answer. Uh, settlement conferences is the big advantage in New York State for borrowers. It is a procedure that is required by state law to give borrowers a chance to negotiate a workout with the lender in good faith to try to keep the house. Um, the court schedules a settlement conference in each foreclosure case, regardless of whether someone shows up or not. And they will send you a letter telling you when the first conference will be held. This is typically when the legal services agencies like Center for Elder Law and Justice get involved. We have attorneys at these initial settlement conferences in New Western New York, um, in most of the counties in Western New York, to conduct an intake and provide help to borrowers with that first conference. We then try to get someone assigned to a, an attorney who can represent them going forward. COVID update, this is one of the first big ones. For a while, these first conferences were not happening because of COVID and the appropriate lockdowns. They are happening now. You will get a letter telling you that you can either call in to a conference. However, um, if you are not able to call in 
Courts do have virtual kiosks available so you can access the first virtual conference. These are being held virtually, so it's important that you work out what's the best way to access that for you. If you have any questions, you could always call the court. They'll include that number two to work out how you can appear. But what I recommend above and beyond that is before that first conference, contact the Foreclosure Prevention Project. We've got that number right there. That's the intake line for the Foreclosure Prevention Project. That is 716-828-8428. Try to get that as soon as you get that letter for that first conference, because then we can do an intake, get an, you assigned to an attorney who can then appear at the conference on your behalf. So I really recommend that when you get that letter for that first conference, you call the foreclosure prevention project before that conference happens. And if you want to call into the court, that's fine. I would just recommend getting an attorney first, given that virtual appearances can be a little more complicated than just driving to the courthouse. Um, a couple of things about the settlement conference process. They're run by a court referee, which is usually a judge's law clerk, not a judge themselves. It's meant to be a less formal process it's really not meant to argue whether or not the bank can foreclose or not. It's just to make sure that both parties can try to negotiate. And the um, specific words here are a mutually agreeable resolution in good faith, ideally to keep the borrower in their house. Um, at the initial conference, the borrower will be asked two questions. Do you live in the property and do you want to keep it? Answer yes and yes. Then they qualify for the settlement conference part, and the court will schedule a follow up conference, which is typically 60 days after the first one, 30 days for the borrower to complete a loss mitigation application for the bank, 30 days for the bank to review the same and then come back. They usually request additional documents from the borrower just to make sure that they have all the information they need to make a loan modification offer, for example. Um, but then you come back for a status update. The big benefit of the settlement conference part is that while you're in that part, the foreclosure action is on hold. And this was before COVID. This has nothing to do with the COVID um, holds or anything. This is a specific area of New York State law that puts the foreclosure on hold while you're in settlement conference. As long as you're negotiating in good faith and providing documentation to the bank where they need that, you'll likely stay in the conference part and ideally, you'll work out a solution there and not have to deal with anything further in the foreclosure actions. Um, next, loss mitigation, like I mentioned, you submit an application to the bank saying, here's my hardship, here's what I make, here's the money I have. The bank will review it to see what offer they can make, which typically results in one of a few outcomes. So either offer a loan modification, which is not a refinance, but it does restructure your loan to bring you current and set up a new payment monthly payment schedule. Some ways that they can do this involve, say, extending the term of the loan, adjusting the interest rates, and trying to bring down the monthly payment a little bit to make it more manageable. Sometimes the monthly payment does decrease, sometimes it doesn't. A uh, short sale, which would be selling the property for less than what is owed, and the bank will forgive the remainder. The bank needs to approve that because they are going to be taking a loss on what is totally owed. So they need to approve that. But if you owe less than what the house is worth and just want to sell it straight to pay off the loan, you generally can do that if you'd like. Uh, next common outcome is what's called a deed in lieu or a deed in lieu of foreclosure, which you deed the property back to the bank, which they would go ahead and sell it at that point and you move out and the bank forgives the remainder owed on the loan. Um, it's an avoid, it avoids the foreclosure because there's not gonna be like a foreclosure judgment against you. Um, and sometimes with a short sale or a deed in lieu, there's some cash assistance for relocation and moving. Um, the, most of the time you want the loan modification because that lets you stay in the house and start making payments again. The bank puts you into a trial plan, usually three to six months, wants to see if you can make it payment each of the three months. Once you do that, they will roll you into a permanent loan modification, have you sign some additional documents that gets slapped together with the original mortgage and that updates your payment schedule. Um, anything that you owed 
from the default up through the loan modification gets re-added back into the principal. That's uh, part of really every loan modification that you get into. Um, sometimes they will defer some to a balloon payment on the end. Sometimes they'll forgive some. Um, it really depends on your specific situation. So I consult with an attorney for more specific advice on that relative to a, whatever situation you might find yourself in. Well, what happens if we can't resolve things in conference? Then you are released, is the word that the courts use, from the settlement conference part. Case gets assigned to a judge. The bank will submit two motions. Order of reference, asking the court to appoint someone to calculate the total amount owed on the loan. Once that happens, they'll move for a judgment of foreclosure and sale, which they're asking court to let them sell the property at auction. Prior to COVID, these took about six months to happen um, collectively. So it'd be about three months for the order of reference, about three months after that for the judgment of foreclosure and sale. Now, because of COVID, this is another big update. There are additional conferences the court will schedule between the bank and the borrower. Um, if the borrower does not appear at the first conference, uh, it's really just a status to see if they can move forward on this. The court schedule a second one. If the borrower doesn't appear at the second one, then the court will start to rule on the motion or if the property is vacant and the lender can demonstrate that the property is vacant, the court will say, okay, you can move forward. Um, which is why that six month timeline has really been extended because it's also a logistical thing of the courts needing to schedule time for these conferences. Um, after the conference, if you did put in an answer, this is when you or your attorney, hopefully your attorney, will go in front of the judge to argue about what you put in the answer and whether the bank has the legal right to foreclose on the property. Now we'll get into some of the big additional COVID changes. Um, and these are some of the moratoriums you might have heard about. So these apply to specific loans. So there's moratorium for loans backed by a federal agency. These are FHA, VA, and U.S. Department of Agriculture or USDA loans. They are on a moratorium in terms of the foreclosure moving forward until at least the end of the July. That may be extended. It may not. You would want to consult uh, HUD.gov or again Google FHA or VA or USDA foreclosure moratorium. Probably find the most recent one there, or consult an attorney or your individual lender um, to see also what type of loan you have and whether you are protected under these moratoriums. New York courts, however, at least in Western New York are still scheduling status conferences while these moratorium, moratoriums are going on just to see if a resolution can be worked out before these moratoriums expire. So be aware of that if you've got a pending case. Same thing if you've got a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan, that moratorium has also been extended until the end of this month. If it's a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac multi-home loan or a multi-family dwelling, that has been extended through September of 2021 because the legislatures and the federal agencies are anticipating a loss of rental income through that that would be more difficult to recoup. So you will really want to check with an attorney and with your specific lender on what type of loan you have and what federal hold you fall under. This does again prevent a letter from starting or continuing with a foreclosure on these federally backed mortgages, but some loans aren't covered, so you really want to check. Uh, consult your servicer, and this is the company that you pay your mortgage to and that um, you generally deal with when you're dealing with any mortgage questions. Um, one thing I also want to touch on quickly are foreclosure scams because those have really proliferated during COVID. We saw them. Um, a few of them before the pandemic, but with everyone having to be in lockdown and a little more isolated, these really just blossomed over the past year and a half. Um, and because foreclosures are public information, scammers will find them and will target the borrowers. Uh, unfortunately here, elderly borrowers are at a higher risk of being targeted by scammers. And unfortunately, these scams that I've seen people encounter 
most of the time it's towards an elderly individual. So one of the common scams that you'll see is the scammer will send a letter to the borrower telling them that there's an auction scheduled and it's going to be like incredibly soon within the next few days or a week. And they'll say, well, if you work with our company, we can resolve the foreclosure with like a 1% or 2% interest rate or like a hundred dollar a month payment or something pretty ridiculous like that. Or if it sounds too good to be true, it probably isn't true. Um, so it, it doesn't really pass the smell test, but other times they'll say that they can rework a mortgage. Oh, your house was sold. We can totally get this back and set you up with a payment plan, which uh, they really wouldn't be able to unless they bought the house. Um, and most of the time, that's not going to be something the buyer's going to reach out to do. Um, and Or they'll say, no, we can definitely get you a loan modification with a, again, an absurdly low interest rate. Uh, no reputable organization can or will guarantee that you'll get a loan modification. Um, they'll say, we can help you with the application process. We can, you know, assist you getting your documents together, but they won't guarantee a specific outcome. Uh, a lot of times also these will charge absurdly high rates for uh, collecting your documents and putting a loan modification to pack it together. There are plenty of low to no cost resources for borrowers facing these hardships, including the housing counseling agencies like the Buffalo Urban League or the Belmont Housing Center, as well as the legal services providers like Center for Elder Law and Justice. Um, phishing scams also ratcheted up. I think we've all gotten a bunch of robocall recently. They'll call pretending to be your lender and they'll ask for personal information. My recommendation with this is always, if you feel uncomfortable, hang up, pull out your mortgage statement, call your lender directly and say, hey, I got this call, did you need this information? Because then you know you're calling the right place and most of the time they'll say, no, we didn't need that information. That was a scam. And they can be on notice that someone's trying to scam by claiming to be that. And some legal help for borrowers. Um, Center for Elder Law and Justice is available to help borrowers who reside in the property and want to maintain home ownership but can't afford an attorney. Please reach out if you have any questions or need assistance. I did also give that number for the Foreclosure Prevention Projects intake line. Um, you can contact us at Center for Elder Law and Justice specifically at 716-853-3087. And we are located at the main court building at 438 Main Street, Suite 1200. Um, just because we're a little busy right now on with things starting to pick up after the pandemic, I just recommend you call and make an appointment if you ha are having any sort of issue. And I think that wraps up my end of the presentation. If there are any questions or if we've got Tatiana on the line. Hi, Alice. Thank you very much for that presentation. I think we do have Tatiana. I'm going to try to join her in. And there are no questions right now, except if this um powerpoint will be available later yes it will be so let me try to get tatiana on my name is tatiana robinson i am the assistant legal counsel at buffalo municipal housing authority and today i'll be speaking to you about landlord tenant fundamentals as applied in new york state specifically um, a lot of the concepts do apply to other states but we will be specifically looking at new york state so i wanted to start off with um, defining the relationship of a landlord tenant relationship and um, tenant's possession is exclusive. That's kind of the main concept here. Um, in a generic landlord-tenant relationship, the property owner retains fee title or other superior interest in the demise. Demise is a word that we use um, a lot in the legal arena, and um, it means to convey or grant an estate, and it's either by lease or will. So I'm just going to say demise premises, while the tenant by grant or conveyance acquires the right to the exclusive use and possession during the lease term. So that's the key concept here is that the property owner is conveying um, or granting exclusive use and possession. That's what the tenant has and the landlord still retains title in the property. So typically this arrangement will be, will be memorialized in written form. That's a lease. 
In addition to the actual delivery of possession, there is an implied covenant of quiet enjoyment in every lease. Quiet enjoyment is a guarantee by the landlord that third parties will not interfere with the tenant's possession or possessory claim to the subject property or space. Typically, the breach is cited in cases involving disruptive con conditions which trigger the abandonment of all or part of the premises demise. I won't go into the specifics of that, but essentially if there's a lien or some other sort of interest in the property and the tenant is forced to give up possession, then that would be um, a violation of their right to quiet enjoyment. In comparison to the implied covenant of quiet enjoyment, is the implied warranty of habitability. And this serves to ensure that the premises are fit for human habitation, the condition of the premises is in accord with the uses reasonably intended by the parties. So um, if you're intending for it to be residential and there are you know, loud events or things that are sort of disrupting that intention, then you can say this is um, a breach of the implied warranty of habitability. Um, also included, tenants will not be subjected to any conditions endangering or detrimental to life, health, or safety. Oftentimes when we see um, tenants invoking this, it's an affirmative defense. So you would raise this in a holdover or non-payment proceeding for anything. So say, for example, you're a tenant who doesn't pay rent because the stairs are, um, the stairs aren't as you intended them to be, or there, or some other issue is happening in the pre premises where it's really detrimental to life, health, or safety. So not chipping paint, unless it's lead paint, but something more substantial, then the tenant could raise this as an affirmative defense and say, hey, listen, I didn't pay my rent because the ceiling was caving in, or there was water pouring into my bedroom, something of that nature. Now let's discuss the exception to the tenant's right to exclusive possession, and that is for inspection and repairs. So a landlord does retain a right of entry. Absent a reservation by lease or obligation created by statute, a landlord generally has no right of entry into a tenant's space, absent the tenant's consent to affect inspections and repairs. But excluding emergencies, so in cases of fire or other life-threatening situations, the landlord can enter without any notice, but um, generally when permitted or authorized, proper notice, proper advance notice is required and a reasonable amount of time is, is not really that much. You only have to give about 24 hours or more. So in addition to exclusive possession of a, uh, excuse me, of a specified portion of property, two other elements are pivotal, pivotal in the creation of a lease or tenancy, and that is the duration, so the term and consideration, which is considered rent. Um, unless prohibited by statute or public policy considerations, there is no restriction on a tenancy's duration. So this can extend for as little as a month or as long as a lifetime or even more. The duration must be stated clearly and ambiguously, for in the absence of a definite term, New York law will usually assign a short one. When an occupancy spans from month to month or when a tenant holds over beyond the expiration of its term, the landlord accepts rent for any period thereafter, a month to month tenancy is created. Alex, are we good on the slides? Do you know where we're at? Uh, does it find a landlord tenant relationship? Yes. Okay. okay. That's where we're at. Just make sure. and such, I don't actually see um, the presentation as it's going on. Okay, upon termination of tenancy, the rights of exclusive use and possession of the premises revert back to the landlord. Um, okay, let's talk quickly about the dual components of a lease. It's both a contract and a conveyance. A lease or rental agreement is a contract creating mutual obligations. That's to be understood as the landlord has obligations and rights, the tenant has obligations and rights. So there's mutual obligations between the landlord and tenant. It is also a present conveyance of an estate and a designated portion of real property for a specified term. I think people think that landlord-tenant law is really kind of simplistic because we um, have summary proceedings which are simpler than a plenary action when you go to um, Supreme Court. But really, property law is a one of the oldest sort of 
uh, ideas or concepts where law kind of derives from and, and arguably is the oldest. So there's a lot of complexities to landlord tenant law that people don't necessarily understand. That's what I'm trying to do sort of briefly right now is go over those. Um, you know, um, um, I did want to mention that a lease may inadvertently come into existence by way of a party's actions. You don't necessarily have to execute a lease. If you're acting in a way that um, appears to be a landlord-tenant relationship, then the courts will hold it as such. Um, by way of example, in one case, the landlord's acceptance of rent payments from a deceased tenant's employee created a direct landlord-tenant relationship even when the owner had characterized the payments as use and occupancy rather than rent. Um, interestingly, the modern residential lease is essentially a sale of shelter and services. An apartment dweller is today viewed functionally as a consumer of housing services as much as a consumer as much a consumer of the purchaser of any goods or services. In New York City particularly, the Department of Consumer Affairs has given notice that the offering of rental housing is a legitimate area of interest for consumer protection against deceptive advertising and misrepresentation. I found that to be interesting and just thought um, that could be of interest to the listeners as well. A tenant's right of exclusive possession and the landlord's right to the reversion upon termination, that just means that the landlord gets the premises, the possession of the premises back, are just two of the defining elements of a tenancy. A number of additional rights and obligations may be delineated in the lease's provisions or may rise through the application of statutes or common law. Remember the implied warranty of habitability and the implied, war uh, implied covenant of quiet enjoyment even if those aren't specifically articulated in the lease, they are covered. So the tenants, they are protection for the tenant um, and whether the lease articulates it or not, it exists and it, it will be prosecuted if you know brought to court. For example, actually no, let me go. So a number of additional rights and obligations may be delineated in the lease's provisions or may arise through the application of statutes or common law. Depending on the nature of the tenancy, these rights and obligations will differ substantially. For example, in the residential context, the landlord's maintenance and repair obligations have been found to be non-delegable and may not be shifted to the tenant. Those are the types of things that actually can't be, um, if they're in a lease that the tenant has to do such and such, sometimes they can be agreed upon, but sometimes they'll be considered um, unconscionable or illegal and they'll just be stricken or striked out from the lease and the rest of the um, legal terms will remain. Now let's turn to statutory protections and benefits for seniors in particular. So before getting into the specifics, I wanted to mention with seniors, questions often arise as to whether an apartment can constitute a party's primary residence when the individual is confined to a nursing home. Factors to be considered include whether the tenant maintains furnishings and other personal belongings in the apartment, whether the tenant receives mail, for example, bank statements at the resident's address and whether the tenant intends to abandon the unit and permanently relocate to the facility. Um, the complexities of that go much deeper, but I just wanted to touch on that as a cursory mention. Um, I did also want to mention that seniors have statutory protection benefits, um, especially considering um, the termination of lease to relocate to a family member's residence termination of lease to relocate to an adult care facility, or termination of lease for uh, to move to a senior or subsidized housing. And that is an you know, early termination. So before the fixed term ending date, seniors have um, protections and benefits that allow them to terminate early. So persons 62 years of age or older are subject to a number of statutory protections and benefits. A tenant who is at least 62 years or old or, or who will reach that age during a lease term or who has a spouse who is or will reach that age has the right under New York Real Property Law Section 227A to terminate the lease and to be relieved of liability thereunder when relocating to a family member's residence, health adult care facility, or senior or subsidized low income housing. The tenant must terminate the tenancy by providing 30 days written notice. And I interpret that now too, so it's not just me, um, as the when you when you um, tender notice, it doesn't actually trigger or become effective until the next 
date that rent becomes due and payable. So if you were to issue notice on July 1st, it wouldn't become effective until August 1st. It wouldn't trigger until August 1st and be effective until the end of August, beginning of September, September 1st. So just to bear that in mind when it says 30 days written notice, you really have to consider when the next date that rent becomes due and payable. Um, also, besides the notice to the landlord, you must also present documentation of admission or pending admission to one of the qualifying facilities or a physician's certification. So uh, if you're going to be staying with a family member, then you need a physician's certification accompanied by a notarized statement from a family member stating that you are um, related and will be relocating to that family member's residence for a period of no less than six months. Note that the landlord is expressly prohibited from interfering with the tenant's removal from its property of violation can expose the miscreant um, to a misdemeanor conviction, which may result in imprisonment for up to a year or $1,000 fine or both. Um, by the way, miscreant, I just wanted to say, is another term often used in the legal arena. It means a person who behaves badly or in a way that breaks the law. Um, upon the initial execution of the lease between a senior and the property owner, the owner or lesser of a qualifying facility or unit of which the senior tenant has applied for admission must provide such tenant with a written explanation of the tenant's right to terminate the existing lease. So all the information I stated before needs to be in the lease when the uh, person is signing the lease. So it has to be noticed so that the person is aware of the fact that they can do this. It can't be some sort of hidden agenda. Um, especially during the COVID-19 period, I've been asked about tenant occupants. So I just wanted to give a brief list of what these types of occupants would look like and how to terminate them. Alex, I don't think there's a slide on this. Um, I think I'm just going to sort of briefly go through these quickly. Um, summary proceedings are available to property owners when landlord tenant, when no landlord tenant relationship exists. So if you're in one of the, you find yourself in one of these unfortunate circumstances, you still can um, use a summary proceeding to remove the non-tenant occupant from your property. Um, among the classes of occupants covered by the statute um, are, so the statute meaning the statutes that allow you to file a summary proceeding, eviction proceeding against this person. So non-tenant occupants are occupants of property which has been sold, occupants who are on property under an agreement with the owner to occupy and cultivate it, and the agreement has expired, squatters or intruders, occupants of property that has been sold for unpaid taxes or a tax deed and has been executed and delivered, occupants of property that has been sold in foreclosure and the deed has been delivered or a copy of it has been shown to the occupant, life tenants who hold over after the termination of their life estate, licensees, sellers of real property who hold over without permission of the purchaser, vendees who who under contracts of sale, the performance of which is to be completed within 90 days after its execution, for example, and possession who default in the performance of the sales contract, occupants who enter the property or remain in possession by force or unlawful means, and who were not in quiet possession for three years before the time of the forcible or unlawful entry or detainer. Um, and it can go a little bit further, employees whose possession was incident to employment. So that's just a few of the non-tenant occupants. It's a pretty exhaustive list, but I'm sure there's other uh, non-tenant occupants out there, but essentially you um, can use a summary, a summary proceeding. So if a property owner sues to evict an occupant pursuant to New York Real Property Law Section 713, that's the law that authorizes a landlord to um, remove a non-tenant occupant. Um, due process does require, however, that a notice to quit be served in a manner calculated to ensure that the document is delivered to the intended recipient. Usually a notice will suffice. That's what I would recommend is a 10-day notice to quit prior to notice, um, notice of petition and petition being served upon the non-tenant occupant. So even still, if a person forces their way into your property, you still don't want to use self-help evictions like forcibly removing the person or changing the locks because there are some hefty fines and some 
um, civil penalties that are associated with that, you would still want to go through the legal process of issuing a notice to quit and then filing a notice and petition, service of papers, et cetera. We'll get into the details of that later. Um, okay, so I'll quickly discuss what distinguishes a license from a lease. It's not going to be a very long discussion, but I just want to touch on it. So what defines an occupancy relationship is the party's intention. Neither the characterization, i.e. labeling the document as a lease or license, nor the language utilized in a writing are necessarily dispositive. The transfer of absolute possession and control is what differentiates a lease from a license or any other property related arrangement. A license generally is non-exclusive and cancelable at will and without cause. When a license has expired, been revoked, or when the grantor of the license is no longer entitled to possession of the property, a 10-day notice to quit may be issued and served in a manner consistent with service of process in a summary proceeding, which is governed by RPAPL Section 735. I want to mention this could be, say, for example, your tenant um, allows their grandson for a bit. You could say that the um, that your tenant um, issued a license to that person and has since revoked it. If there's any issues, and then you can send, uh, you can issue a 10-day notice. Um, really, these sorts of situations are colorable, and you can kind of consider. You could either say, "Hey, listen, you to your tenant, you weren't authorized by your lease, and you didn't get a specific author authorization from me personally to have this person stay here, so that's a lease violation on you." Or you could sort of bifurcate the situation at the um, grandson specifically and sort of just address them and not address the tenant. I would actually recommend addressing the tenant specifically and then um, having them sort of uh, have a conversation with whomever, but sometimes it can get kind of contentious and the grandson doesn't want to leave. We've experienced some um, situations like that. Okay, moving on to Non-tenant occupants known as squatters. I know this issue has come a lot up a lot since COVID-19. Um, a squatter has been defined as one who settles on the land of another without legal authority. There are no rights of possession. No rights of possession are conveyed to a squatter or an intruder who enters another's property without permission and to whom no subsequent consent is granted. An intruder is distinguished. An intruder. Sorry, get what slide you're on. Oh. So I'm still on, it's not really, a, I don't think I actually put these in slides because I was supposed to go through these. Um, maybe occupancy is similar to tenancies, so that should be okay. on slide four. Yep, thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So intruder distinguished, an intruder has been defined as one who enters upon property without, without right. That's generally like a trespasser. Um, squatter notice requirements. Um, same idea, the law treats licensees and squatters as equivalents for purposes of receiving the 10-day notice to quit before the petitioner landlord may in institute a proceeding to recover possession. Um, okay, so now let's talk about when a landlord-tenant relationship exists. There's usually a formal lease that memorializes the relationship. However, a lease may be um, expressed or implied, meaning it might actually be written or it can be inferred or deduced from your habitual sort of what has happened in the past between both landlord and tenant. So a tenancy is a consensual occupancy arrangement which can be created by an express formal lease or by operation of law. One may become a tenant at will or a periodic simply by a landlord's inaction or acceptance of an occupant's rent payment. So even if um, a lease has not been executed, if the landlord is acting in a way that would appear to be um, landlord-tenant, then they can't just say, hey, listen, you know what, I don't actually know who you are and I don't know why I'm accepting rent from you. That wouldn't be a, you know, a sufficient um, excuse for forcibly removing a tenant from the premises. In such instances, the party's rights and obligations arise not from express contract, but from statute or the relationship of landlord-tenant. Let's talk about the lease really quickly. I'm sorry, I'm going, uh, well, I still have 10 minutes, so I'm gonna run through this. An agreement, a lease is an agreement for a fixed term, which affords a party exclusive possession and control of delineated space in exchange for payment of money or consideration. Um, however, the party's intent, not the label of fixed, will control the agreement's legal, legal effect. Um, leases may be made orally or in writing, but the statute of frauds provides that oral rental agreements are enforceable only if for a period 
not exceeding one year. If for more than one year, the rental agreement must be in writing and signed by the party to be charged unless the lease is created by an operation of law. Um, I'm not going to go into the pros and cons. It's pretty obvious what the pros and cons are, but um, I will go into other lease essentials. So some lease essentials are, okay, uh, lease essential terms. A valid lease must include essential terms. While no particular legal terminology is required to ensure that a tenancy is formed, it should minimally confer exclusive possession and control, identify the parties, de describe the premises being demised, and list the rent sought and delineate the specific occupancy term. Um, the amount of rent, specify the rent to be paid and the applicable time frames or payment intervals. Um, you know, these aren't necessarily required, but it's highly recommended. Payment of rent, absent from statutory or contractual limitation, the right to fix the amount of payment um, to be remitted to the occupancy of properties entirely within the landlord's purview. And honestly, within New York State, if you're just dealing with typical landlord-tenant residential relationship, um, it's whatever the market will bear. There really isn't any um, statute or law saying what rent is too high. It's whatever the market will bear. Um, there are some, there are a lot of regula regulations and statutes applying to um, subsidized tenants, but not in just a normal landlord-tenant relationship. Um, application of payments in the absence of an agreement to the contrary, the landlord may apply the monies received from the tenant either to the rent arrears, which they're to for accrued, or to the current rent, unless proof is evinced as to how the landlord credited the funds, it will be presumed that the payments were applied against the oldest sums due. Time for payment, if a, if a day on which the rent falls due is a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, the payment will be remitted on the next business day. Um, also, I wanted to mention this because I noticed this in practice, receipt for payment of rent. A lot of tenants do not receive receipts of payment, and it's actually statutorily obligated. So if a landlord receives rent in any form other than a personal check, the landlord must provide the pair with a written receipt containing the date, amount paid, identity of the premises, period for which the rent is paid, and signature and title of the person receiving the rent. And I can't stress that enough. It's really important that um, tenants receive this um, from their landlords because it's difficult to prove sometimes I'm already in court. Um, okay, really quickly I want to touch on security deposits. Um, security deposit defined as security deposit is a consideration advance from the lease or lease agreement and is held by the lessor or licensor to ensure an occupant's full performance of the terms and conditions of the underlying contract. Security will generally consist of the deposit of monies and an amount perceived to be sufficient to afford the tenant an incentive to fulfill its obligations. That sense that it can't be more than one month rent. Um, Payment of security deposit has been held to be a substantial obligation of the tenancy. Accordingly, a tenant's failure to furnish a lawful security deposit or to maintain the security throughout the term of the lease can trigger the commencement of a holdover proceeding. Note this, because security deposits are not quote unquote rent, they may not be recovered by way of a non-payment proceeding. You would bring a holdover proceeding for a security deposit issue. Um, some things have changed since COVID, the COVID-19 period. On May 7, 2021, um, given the economic and uncertainty triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic, temporary amendments to the New York General Obligation Law permit landlords to enter into written agreements with tenants to apply security deposits towards rental arrears. Um, the deposit must be replenished by the tenant at a rate of one twelfth the amount used as rent per month and said payments beginning no less than 90 days the date of the application of the deposit. But prior to that, um, really they weren't allowing them to be applied. Um, mostly it should be for uh, uh, damage beyond normal wear and tear is what a landlord can use a security deposit for. And I wanted to mention that um, effective June 14th, 2019, um, they must be returned within a 14 day period uh, after the tenant has vacated. Quickly, I'm just going to go into power of termination because I know that people are interested in eviction. So generally, a tenancy will not end prior to its scheduled expiration date or term unless authorized by the party's lease or applicable law. Um, for example, most lease agreements contain forfeiture provisions which permit early termination upon the tenant's violation of a substantial obligation of the tenancy. 
Um, several state statutes also authorize termination when, for instance, the premises are used for an illegal or immoral purpose or are destroyed. Um, Rent-regulated tenancies may only be ended on the regulatory scheme. Landlords customarily reserve the power to end the tenancy upon the violation of a lease obligation. Since rental agreements usually include a multitude of tenant covenants and obligations, courts are reluctant to condone the termination for, or forfeiture of a leasehold for a technical or de minimis breach or violation of a minor lease obligation. So it really does have to be either repeated minor violations or a substantial violation of the lease. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, in general, summary proceedings are divided into two types of proceedings. We have non-payment and we have um, holdover. Alex, are you clear on which slides we're on? Because I kind of skipped some. Terminating landlord-tenant relationship. Yes. Good. Okay. So when a landlord wishes to terminate uh, a lease based on the violation of a substantial obligation of the tenancy, there will usually be a contractual requirement for the issuance of a written predicate notice, commonly known as commonly known as a notice to cure or default notice. And I can't stress this enough. I think that a lot of landlords, it's not necessarily lazy, or it might just be that they don't know. Um, Prior to terminating a tenancy, there should be a default notice or a notice to cure. Such notice will specify the nature and substance of the breach, breach and advise that should the objection remain um, uncorrected upon the lapse of time provided, a subsequent notice to the tenancy will ensue. If the tenant does not timely address the default, the landlord may then issue the additional notice which terminates the tenancy and advises that a holdover or non-payment proceeding will be commenced upon this latter's notice of expiration. This approach is referred to as the exercise of the lease's condi conditional limitation. A conditional limitation is a provision calling for the automatic termination of a lease upon the occurrence of a specified event, usually the passage of a cure period without the tenant affecting a correction of the default. Um, also to note, um, just to state, the New York Real Property Law Section 711, that's the illegal removal of a tenant. I just wanted to mention that. Um, okay, so procedure for termination generally. You want to issue that predicate notice, and then after that, if they don't care, then you can issue a notice of termination, um, generally 30 days, but it depends on the circumstances, so I don't want to get into the nuances of that. Um, a notice to cure needs to specify the nature of the violation. Okay, we were actually already pretty much touched on that. Um, all termination notices must be timely, definite, and unequivocal. So just make it clear. Make It doesn't need to be like overly uh, legal, flowery wording. You just want to state specifically which clause in the lease they violated. Make it clear. Use a larger point font. Don't use 12, use 14, something of that. And just be really clear and make sure that you give sufficient notice and that it's um, served properly, which we're going to get into really quickly. So service of process. that. Um, is governed by RPAPL, which is Real Property Actions Proceedings Law, Section 735. Um, service of the notice of petition and petition shall be made by personally delivering them to the respondent. So that's the ideal first step. Um, secondly, you can deliver them to a person of suitable age and discretion who resides or is employed at the property thought to be recovered. You want a, um, a copy of the notice of petition and petition Reasonable application admittance can be obtained, and such person found to will receive it, or if admittance cannot be obtained, so if you can't find the actual person or a person of suitable age and discretion at the property, you may affix a copy of the notice of petition and petition upon a conspicuous part of the property, generally the unit door, the front door of the unit, or you can actually slip it under the door um, as well, and then you also must mail uh, by certified mail and regular first class mail a copy of the notice petition and petition, as well as service of process affidavit. Um, so, you know, there is a lot more information that I have here, but I can only go over so much, and I think that that pretty much covers the basics and fundamentals of landlord-tenant law in New York State in 30 minutes. Um, so if there's any questions, feel free to, feel free to ask. Thank you, Tatiana. I don't see any questions regarding your presentation at this moment. I'd like to thank everyone for joining.
today's presentation. Thank you, Tatiana and Alex, for all the information you provided. Um, there will also be a brief survey following this presentation. If you could fill that out, we'd appreciate it. And please join us again tomorrow for our presentation on the benefits of irrevocable and schooled trust at 10 a.m. Thank you again, guys. Thank you. Thank you.